I will do, I want to introduce uh, Philip Folia. And after he speaks, then I think we may have some time for a couple of questions and answers for uh, Dr. Schloss and Philip Folia. First, wait there. <laughs> Uh, Philip Folia was born and raised in the Belmont section of the Bronx. He attended Lehman College and received a fellowship from the University of California. He graduated from Pace Law School where he was an editor of the Law Review. He worked for the Council of Belmont Organizations and the Italian American Alliance for Education before, before joining the Bronx District Attorney's Office. He was a special assistant United States Attorney under Rudy Giuliani and was executive assistant DA in Queens County. He was appointed by four different mayors to various commissions and by uh, the governor to the CUNY Construction Fund. After 18 years in private practice, he joined the uh, New York State Inspector General's office. He was the pro bono counsel for over 20 years to the Bronx Special Olympics, the first uh, chief counsel of the Italian American Legal Defense and Higher Education Fund, and founded the Child Reach Foundation with his childhood friend, actor uh, Ch Chaz Palmentieri, which has raised over a million dollar, a million and a half dollars for research into uh, Cooley's anemia and other childhood diseases. Uh, Cooley's anemia, by the way, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, uh, um, a lot. A uh, number of African Americans have uh, sickle cell anemia. This is the Italians and Greeks have the, uh, common among them, among the Mediterranean area. Um, he was a founder, uh, he was a founding director of the Italian American Museum and serves currently as vice president. Uh, let's have a nice hand for Philip. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, Dr. Schelza outlined very well what transpired with the discrimination case of, uh, against the city university. I'll give you some of the sort of inside baseball that occurred while the, that case was going on. Uh, we had known for a long time that there was discrimination at the city university, as evidenced by Chancellor Kibbe's uh, directive and John Calandra's uh, groundbreaking work, along with others. Uh, but when they attempted to shut down the institute because of the activism of Tony Gingrasso and, and a whole host of other people, uh, and essentially silenced Dr. Shelsa and dismantled the institute, we brought a legal action. I'll be the first to tell you that although I was a litigator and tried many cases, I had no background in civil rights whatsoever at the time. So we sort of felt our way through the process. Uh, but we learned a whole lot, and not so much because of lawyering skills, but because we were right. We won. And when we initially filed the suit, it's by chance what judge you get assigned to. And we got Constance Baker Motley. They just literally pull it out of a wheel in federal court. And uh, I had heard of her reputation. And of course, she had been involved in Brown versus the Board of Education. And when we went to her chambers, I asked her if she wanted a, a memo of law on the civil rights part. And she said, no, I don't think that'll be necessary. I mean, she was the preeminent voice of civil rights. And I wasn't sure how that was going to play because maybe she wasn't going to take this so seriously. And the first thing she said to me, Joe was waiting outside, and we were in the chambers, was, Mr. Foley, are you telling me this case is about discrimination against Italian Americans? I said, Judge, that's exactly what it's about. She said, isn't the governor of the state of New York an Italian American? I said, yes, that's true. But let me tell you why we were discriminated against. And spent about 10 minutes while Joe was waiting outside describing the case. And then she wanted to meet Dr. Schultz. We told her. Uh, that he was outside, and he came in, and she asked Dr. Shelter, what's going on at the City University of New York? Because she was very informal, and he started to describe it, and she was already signing the, the preliminary injunction against the City University, so I was trying to kick Joe to tell him to stop talking. We won. <laughs> she, she signed it. We're ready to go. And of course, the Attorney General of the State of New York was, and is mandated to represent the City University, and they did. The Attorney General was Robert Abrams at the time. And I actually had a conversation with his chief of staff and ultimately Abrams himself. And Abrams was pushing the university to settle the case. Because he, frankly, politically, it was a real negative for him to be involved. And because of his prodding of the city university, 
uh, and the stubbornness of the university. You know what they did? They fired the Attorney General of the state of New York, which is sort of an unprecedented event, and hired their own attorneys, uh, one of the biggest law firms uh, in, in the state and probably the country, Paul Weiss, who then took up uh, the action to defend them at a, an astronomical cost, by the way. And as Joe pointed out, we were a, a small firm, and they did what the tobacco companies do against litigants. They just ended, endlessly sent us paperwork and motions and writs, trying to basically drum us out of existence and, and forcing us to settle. Now, the disappointing part about this, this whole thing, uh, there are two facts that, that are true about discrimination in Italian Americans. One, there's no question that it exists. There's an anti-Italian bias and anti-Italian discrimination, and it goes back a long time, and unfortunately exists to this day. And secondly, we as a community have never really effectively addressed it. So it was a very lonely battle on many fronts. So we took on this, this cause, and we went to a number of, of uh, different Italian groups, all of whom said they would support us uh, financially, because this was a, a very expensive undertaking when you, you take this kind of a class action suit in federal court. And we uh, raised exactly, what was it? Zero from our community. We had no funding whatsoever, which distinguishes us and, and the courage of Tony G. Grass in forming the, the Legal Defense Fund from every other legal defense fund that's out there that has staff and has funding. We had no staff, no funding, and three lawyers uh, working pro bono, essentially. Now, we ultimately were compensated because we got attorney's fees, but it was a long, <laughs> cold winter, to say the least, when we would show up at depositions against Paul Weiss, myself or one of my partners individually, and sit across from four Paul Weiss attorneys who were each billing, you know, five or $600 an hour. Uh, and this went on for a very long period of time. Uh, so it, it, it was a lonely battle. And Joe is modest, and, and many of you that are here, you know, Janine Coyne, I see, is one of our, our, our litigants, and Enzo, of course. You have to underscore the fact that it took a lot of courage to do what they did. It's not just, oh, we'll start a lawsuit and we'll see what happens. They were risking their reputations, their employment, their careers, their future, and Maria Fosco as well, uh, to do this. And ultimately, we didn't know whether we would win or not. Motley turned out to be on our side from the beginning. The chancellor of the city university was avoiding like the plague coming in to testify, and we subpoenaed her. And the attorneys would make endless excuses about why she couldn't appear. And finally, Motley had, had enough and said, I, I don't care what the chancellor is doing, but if she's not in my courtroom tomorrow morning, federal marshals are going to her office and arresting her and bringing her. And of course, she was there the next morning, bright and early. And I personally cross-examined her for, what, eight hours, Joe? And as Joe indicated, we had these elaborate charts that Enzo Milioni had had uh, drawn up for us with all the statistics. And I asked her at each of the senior colleges how many Italian-American professors were. And she would always say, I don't know. And we got finally to the, the Graduate Center. And I said, how many Italian-American professors are at the Graduate Center? <clears throat> she said, I don't know. I said, well, we have a chart. Can you read that bottom number on the chart and tell the court how many there are? And she reluctantly said, well, zero. And that includes, by the way, Italians' uh, uh, courses in the Italian language didn't even have an Italian professor at the time. So Motley, of course, ultimately uh, called the discrimination unconscionable, which in a, in a federal decision is very strong language, to say the least. Uh, while this was going on, unfortunately, two other things occurred. We were, we were called by uh, a staff member at the governor's office who asked us to discontinue the suit initially because he thought we couldn't win. Uh, and we were happy to, to prove him wrong. I also attended a meeting where, at the Columbus Club, called by an Italian group, and Joe will remember this, and uh, the chancellor was, was sort of trying to reform the image of the city university, so she wanted to go into the heart of the Italian-American community and explain why we were all wrong about what we were doing. And one of the members of the club asked me to come to sort of be at the truth squads, so to speak. And uh, when we were there at the cocktail hour, believe it or not, I was asked to leave because I was making uh, the chancellor nervous, and she was a guest of the Columbus Club. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't want to create a scene, 
But I said, I, just let me understand this. The, the person who is at the head of the organization who discriminates against Italian Americans is welcome here at the Columbus Club, but the lawyer defending these Italian Americans is being asked to leave. Is, is that what I'm here? And that was. Ultimately, it became a big to-do. There was an apology. It came from the board of directors, et cetera. But that's the kind of lonely battle that we wage. And if it wasn't for the, the courage of each and every one of the professors, uh, we wouldn't have achieved what we did. And ultimately, we did 42 arbitrations uh, for 42 different professors. Unfortunately, some of it is still going on. I was talking to Janine today, and I can't believe that's still going on. Uh, but for the most part, the, the arbitrations, we were successful as well. Part of it, I think, is, is also Italian Americans themselves. We're not whiners, right? Uh, we're very introspective. If we don't succeed at something, it's like, well, it must be maybe something that's lacking in me as opposed to some actual discrimination out there. Well, no. There is actual discrimination out there. I remember one of the professors telling me, I can't believe this. For 20 years, I thought I was being discriminated against because I was gay. Now it turns out I'm discriminated against because I'm an Italian American. <laughs> so the, the problem with any kind of invidious discrimination is how does it manifest itself, right? We see it at the City University. We have less jobs, less promotions, less tenure granted, uh, less raises. And we saw that over and over again. But unfortunately, we're 20 years later, and we're still in the same boat in many respects. We've made some progress, but we still don't effectively fight as a community. Sometimes we don't even recognize it. We all know about the, you know, the, the slander about the mafia, et cetera, and people and organized groups are yelling about it all the time. We get that. But how does that ultimately manifest itself? I'm going to leave some papers here that I wrote over the years about uh, jobs in different bureaucracies. And you'll see that we're, we're underrepresented in almost every category. And I'll, and I'll tell you in a minute about the legal community. And where are we overrepresented? We're overrepresented in private industry, where the only sort of thing that counts is the merit in your abilities, right? So we see Italian Americans as titans of industry in construction and various fields, it, it, almost everything that relies only on personal achievement. But where there are government bureaucracies, institutional bureaucracies, check any one of them out. We're underrepresented. 20 years ago, I, I wrote a paper for the, the uh, Colombian lawyers that indicated that we had four judges, only four Italian-American judges in the Southern District of New York, in the federal courts. And I said, the ripple effect of that is you only have four Italian-American judges. Guess what? You're going to have less Italian-American clerks, less Italian-American lawyers working in the system. 20 years ago, we had four. I picked up the Law Journal yesterday, and I have, I have it here with me, and they were celebrating the judges that were uh, appointed in the Second Circuit, which is New York and Connecticut and part of Vermont. There are no Italians in New York and Connecticut, right? <laughs> so they were celebrating the judges that were appointed from 2009 to the present. And there were 21 federal judges appointed in that district. You know how many was Italian American? One. You know how many judges we have in the Southern District right now? Of the approximately, I think it's 45 or 46? Two. We're losing ground. How is that possible? It's because our community remains silent. You see in the Court of Appeals in the state of New York, if someone retires of a certain ethnic group, you better believe that he's going to be replaced or she's going to be replaced by someone in that ethnic group. That doesn't happen in our community because we're too quiet about it. And that's something that, that we need to address. So if I leave you with any messages, we need to be more active about it. Thank you.